Welcome back to Fixing Furniture. I've got an antique sheet music cabinet here that's missing some parts, and these parts can only be reproduced by hand. I'm about to do something I've never done for a customer before. One of the pieces that's missing inside of this cabinet is these arches. So you can see here, this is all hand carved, and I've never done hand carving like this before. So I need to figure out how to replace this part all the way down to this point here. If we look at the door here, you can see that one of the panels has come out. It's fully intact, but what's missing is the piece in the front here that keeps the panel in. So I think it's got a reeded detail here. I'll have to reproduce so it matches what we've got here. And you can also see on top, there's a split. The overall finish of this music cabinet is in really good shape. The top needs to be reattached and there's a few loose pieces. You can see there's a bracket here. The one over here needs to be reattached as well. I've got a lot of work to do here and some experimentation. Stick with me, I'll show you how it's done. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. So where do I start on a project like this? Well, the pieces that I need to reproduce need to have stain and finish on them to match. So that's going to be the longest process. So I'm going to start with those pieces first, and then I can work on the glue ups and that type of thing afterwards. So the first thing I want to do is take this door off and see what I can do on the inside of this gallery. The door you can see here is rubbing on the bottom of the cabinet. And that can happen sometimes with older pieces of furniture. If you watch here, I'll lift up the bottom of the door and you can see it closes up the gap and the door operates freely. So this is really just a loose hinge. What I'll do is take these loose parts out of the cabinet and what I'm going to do is rest it on this side so I can open the door and rest the door on something while I take the screws out of the hinges. Just set some blocks under the door and now I can undo the screws. If you're having a hard time unscrewing slotted screws, what you need to do is make sure that your screwdriver fits properly in that. So if you've got a screwdriver that almost fits, but you're slipping a little bit, what you can do is take a file and sharpen the screwdriver just by holding it on the file and pulling it back. And what that will do is give you a keener edge so that when you put that in the slot, it's going to grip it appropriately. The other problem could be that you've got finish in the slot so just clean that out with a sharp knife, and that's how you can make sure you don't strip a screw when you pull it out. It's also really important to make sure that you've got proper pressure on the screwdriver and you're holding it at the right angle. So what I suggest is hold it down by the front end, put downward pressure on it, and use your hand at the top here really just to turn the handle. And that way you make sure that the screwdriver is staying seated in the screw slot and then you can take it out without having a problem. I've now got the screws out, but you can see there's a little bead right here. And what that does is hold the glass in. It's missing across here. And over here, you can see it's very loose, this one. So I'm gonna to have to make a new one here. And then on this panel, you can see there's a retainer here. There's one that's missing on this side, one missing on this side, but again, this is where we're missing a part on the front. So I've got a few small pieces to make up here before I put the door back on. I'll get this door out of the way, and then we can take a closer look at these parts in here. So I can tell here this has been broken off. Let's just see if there's anything loose here. Well, this bottom's loose, that bottom's loose, that bottom's loose. Oh, okay. So there's one part that I need to reproduce up there. So that's good. And it's loose here. It's almost like this one isn't lined up. It's like someone had glued in a few pieces here. So I don't know if I can get this out. This part here is loose. This part is loose at the back. And this part is really misaligned. I wonder how I can pull this from the top. I wonder if I can get these out. It looks like someone's glued these two pieces in, so I'm gonna to have to undo that. You can see how poorly this was done. So I'll see how I can get that out without breaking it 
so I can get this top part out. I use the camera on my phone and see if I can figure out what type of glue it is. I see some small cracks in the glue, so that leads me to think it might be high glue. I'm going to stick a chisel in here and see if I can chip it out, because high glue is brittle, whereas PVA glue is rubbery. The crunchiness of this glue tells me that it's high glue, and that's easy to reverse with white vinegar. I'll apply a little bit of white vinegar, and I should be able to take this off. So here you can see that there's high glue, and if I wipe this, it takes most of it away. Because it really is just dissolved, so I'll let that harden up. I can scrape it down and then re-glue it, but then I can re-glue it in the right spot here. With the second part removed, you can see this is a little bit loose. And I can see the seam opening up here. So I'm going to pry it from the upper side here and hopefully that'll all come out in one piece. With this piece off, I can tell it's a full finish on the front. This is the natural wood color here. This is birch. So I need to get some birch for this project. And on these other areas, I've got a piece that's missing on the front that's reeded. I need to purchase mahogany. This is solid mahogany. This is mahogany veneer. There's a solid mahogany piece here. So I'm going to use mahogany in that center to make it match as best as possible. Now, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a field trip here. We're going to go to the lumber yard, and I'm going to show you where I purchased my lumber, but I'm also purchasing something called a beading tool. I've had my eye on it online, and I've contacted the seller, and we're going to meet up. My first stop is the lumber yard. Peacock Lumber in Oshawa, Ontario. Fantastic place. I'll see if I can get some footage on the inside to show you what it's like. So here's one of the areas where they got dressed hardwood. We'll go inside and we'll take a look. So in here is where all the wood is dressed. And what that means is that the finish on the wood is smooth, it's not rough. So this is a great spot to come. You can see there's a whole bunch of cherry here. As we move along, you have to know your species when you're in a place like this. This is some walnut, so you can see the nice rich color here. In a lumber yard like this, sometimes there are signs, but sometimes there aren't. So you need someone on staff that can help you find the species you're looking for and the dimensions. In this next building at Shed 1, this is where they've got all the cutoffs, and that's where I buy my material because I only need small amounts for repairs. Let's go take a look. And here, you see there's all kinds of pine. So it's a really long shed, and it's actually two stories. So if I look up here, there's a lot of moldings that are on this side. On the right side here, you can also see all kinds of material that's here. This is tongue and groove, there's cedar, there's pine, lots to choose from. Here's a great big radial arm saw they use to cut off everything, and on this side, these are the cutoffs. So they label them by species at the end, and here we've got some walnut, so that'll be good. I'll take some of that. And over here, what have we got? There's something in here that's dark. Oh. That's a really dark piece of poplar. I don't think I'll take that one. There's lots of work done at this place. They produce moldings, they plane down boards, so there's a lot going on. We're gonna go down to this hardwood shed here, where we can see a forklift working away, because that's where they've got the mahogany. So here's another shed, it's gigantic. It's two stories tall. It's got virtually any species of wood you'd want. So this is one half around this side there's some more material in the end here so I'm going to shop around and get a few different species that I need and I'll show you the mahogany I'm going to pick up as well 
So here's the mahogany. You can see what they do is they label the boards at the end so you can tell how long the boards are. So I'll pick through here and pick some mahogany for this repair. While I'm here, I'm going to stock up on a few things. You can see here they've got yellow birch, so that's great for repairs. Birch is good for imitating mahogany when you stain it. Here we've got some white maple and, of course, some white oak. I need some of that as well. This is my favorite species of wood. This is walnut. And just look at this stack of wood. Really wide boards. Down here you can see we've got some more. But on the left here, look at the size of this lumber. That's just fantastic. I got the wood loaded up in a hurry because it just started to rain. The next stop is to pick up a used tool. At the light, turn right onto Town Line Road North. At the light, turn left onto Nash Road. So this is a beading tool, it's Veritas. It's brand new, in the box, never been used. And the owner is selling it with all the cutters here. So this is a great opportunity to pick up a tool that can no longer be purchased. And here's a Canadian $100 bill, which I'm using to pay for. When you're buying used tools like this, you're looking at paying between 40 and 60% of the retail value. This one turned out to be about 60%. It's in great condition, so I'm really looking forward to using this. The next stop, I've got a cabinet I'm going to purchase that's really inexpensive, but in really bad shape. In one kilometer, turn right to merge onto Highway 401 West. At the light, turn left onto Church Street South. So here's the cabinet. It's in pretty rough shape, but it was $12. Couldn't really pass that up. It's a great find to be able to take something and fix it. The question I've got for you is, would you stain this or would you paint this? It's now time to head back to the workshop. Now that I have my material, the birch and the mahogany, I'm ready to start making these replacement parts. Now, because I've never done carving before like this, I need to reproduce this design. I want to practice on it. So as I plane down this birch, I'm just going to take off the rough surface and I'm going to use that as a way to practice this carving. And then I can plane it down again and then I can cut my part and do the actual piece. Now, one of the things I like about woodworking is there's a constant learning curve. I enjoy learning new things and carving is one of these newer things for me. So I'm going to share with you as I go through this, some of the ways I learn brand new skills and bring those into my workshop and then eventually work them into the business that I run here for furniture repair and restoration. The first thing I'm going to do is trace out this design so I can reproduce it. And to do that, I'm going to use onion skin paper. It's very thin paper that allows me to see through it, but also trace. Let's take a look at what I need to produce over here. So this is the center. It's got a nice gentle curve. It's got matching carvings. And when we go over to the end here, you can see this is the end. The curve here gets sort of interrupted. It's not a full curve. Now there's a line that you can just barely see here. If you look at the top, this is where a piece of wood was joined. If you look at where this is broken, it's fairly straight right here, a bit of green back here. So this joint here matches up with this joint. So I need to reproduce this section just in the opposite format. So the carving I need is somewhere starting about here with that X and then this part here. So this is the part that I'm going to trace. So the finished tracing looks a little bit funny. You see there's a small gap here between the carving and the edge and a large gap here. Let's see what's happening underneath here. Oh, it's actually the same way here. There's a small area here and a larger area here. I wonder if this was carved first, this was assembled, and then this arch was cut afterwards. Hmm. Okay, well, I need to make it match. So the next step is I need the reverse of what I've traced here. So now I'll take the tracing. What I'll do is flip it around. I'm going to tape this to the window 
so I can draw the tracing on the back. I don't have a jointer in my workshop, so I'll plane this by hand to get it flat, but in the meantime, this gives me a surface I can work on for the carving. So here is the piece that I need over here on this side. So what I'll do is I'll flip this over to figure out the piece that I need. And you can see here by this line and this line here, I've got some really good spots to line it up. So what I'm going to do is just set this up for practice. I'll trace out this part and then line up my tracing. And then we'll give this a try. So I traced the inside here, but you can see there's a profile. This profile edge is where the drawing was picking up. So what I need to do is measure from the inside here to figure out where the drawing needs to be. So this should get me the location that I need. So this is the positive side. This is the negative side, so I've marked this as left, so I can remember what side is what. So here it's hard to see, but I've got my reference lines. So that one's on there. This one's on here. And that one's on there. Okay, so I've got it in position. So to transfer, I'm using carbon paper. So I just need to lift this up, put the carbon paper down, put it back down. Now I could go over this with a pencil, but it's going to make my lines thicker and my design less precise. So I'm just going to take an awl and all I need to do is put some pressure on it, move a line all the way down here, for example. And I'll lift that up and it transfers the line nice and cleanly. So I'll just go over the whole design and get this transferred out. So there we go, we've got the design. You can see here I've got the borders of where I need to cut all these parts. I don't have the intricate details in here, I'll have to work that out as I'm doing the carving, but this gives me the parameters of where the carving needs to be and the shape of the parts. Well, this carving is more than I bargained for. What I'm trying to do is essentially reverse engineer how to carve. And I do reverse engineering in my workshop all the time, but the challenge here is I don't know the techniques to properly do this. So I'm having to do a bit of research and then practice, research and practice in between the other projects I'm working on in my workshop. It's such a challenge, I've decided I'm growing a playoff beard. I'm growing out my beard. It's gonna get thicker as I go through this. Um, if you know what a playoff beard is, put a comment in the comments and you can explain that to others. So what I'm going to do is cover off these tools at the end of the carving so you can understand what I've used here. Here's what my carving looks like right now. The proportions up here aren't the same as what are here, so I need to measure that out rather than eyeball it. And you can see I've got some tear out here. It's not that crisp. 
So I do have some techniques I need to work through here a little bit more, but the one up here was challenging in terms of uh, using a chisel. So I thought if I just chopped this one side on each side, I'd be able to get this part duplicated, but it hasn't worked. So the technique I found is using a carving knife, I can actually create this oval and I can reproduce the detail that's up in here. So it caught me by a bit of a surprise that this was the tool that made me successful at that, but it's also giving me a hint that maybe I need to use this a little bit more in the carving up here. I've got more learning and practicing to do here, and hopefully my playoff beard doesn't get too bushy before I'm successful at this particular part of the project. The next part of the project I'm going to work on is this split top here. You can see the gap here, it's almost 3 eighths of an inch. So this gap is created because these boards were not allowed to move. Wood moves with seasonal wood movement, it expands in the summertime and shrinks in the wintertime. And by these boards being locked into position somehow, it's created this gap. So the boards need to float. So I'm going to put this on its side and we'll see what's happening underneath because someone has definitely modified this that's created that problem. Oh, yeah, I can see right here, there's the issue. If we look at this piece of trim here that's going across the grain, you can see there's a screw here and there's another one down at the end. So that's what's preventing this wood from moving. Also, if I look underneath here, there's a bunch of glue blocks in there. I need to figure out how those are attached. I'll take these screws out on both sides and then I'll see what else I have to do to get this top apart so I can glue it back together again. On the second side where the screw is here, this piece has been broken off and there's a nail that I can see there. So there's been some damage here before. With the screws out here, this part here, I can now slide closed. So this is what should happen. This wood should move back and forth to allow for seasonal wood movement. The reason this part has to move here is at the front here, it needs to be tight so all the joinery here stays tight. So this is fixed, this is floating. So I'll need to pull this apart and get some glue in there so I can re-glue the top. There's a bunch of glue residue here, so I'll just clean it off with a scraper and I can clamp this up and glue it back together again. As I'm cleaning off this glue, it's very crunchy, so let me just let you listen here. So that's telling me that this is high glue. And typically I'd glue up a seam like this with PVA glue, but because it's high glue and I'm not likely going to get all of it off, high glue will reactivate high glue, so that's what I'm going to use here. And it is as strong as PVA. I've got a video that shows how Tom Johnson glued up some joints like this and then tried to break them on the seam, and you can see the result there. I'll leave a link in the video description. I'm applying glue to both sides of this joint to make sure I've got full glue coverage, and then I'll clamp it up and we'll let it dry. I'll just wipe up the glue squeeze out while it's still wet here. I'm just using a damp cloth and we'll be good to go. With the top glued up, I still have some glue blocks to put in, but that will come later. Next, I'm going to work on this door. And this is where I get to use my new beading tool. So this panel had come out here. It just slides in here like this. So I'll set that down. So you can see I'm missing a piece right here that holds these pieces in. And it needs to look like this. So this has a beaded profile, so I need to create one here. And in order to do that, I need a piece of mahogany. To the right of my miter saw, this is where I keep my cutoffs. This is where I normally grab my stock, but on this part here, this is where I've got some small pieces. So I just have to look through here, find a few pieces of mahogany. Oh, looks like we've got some here at the top. Right here. With a couple of pieces that'll work here, I can now get out my brand new beading tool. Be sure to go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter for links to new videos, workshop tips, and more. Now back to fixing furniture. There are a number of different cutter heads for this beading tool, so I'll need to take a look at these and see which is going to match the profile best for this. This is called a fluting cutter, so what it does is it cuts a shallow piece in the wood. That's not what I need. This is the beading cutter and it cuts a groove, so it will leave a bead on either side, but it only does one. I need multiple, 
And so that's what I need is a reading cutter and it will cut multiple profiles at once. So that's the cutter head that I need. These reading cutting heads, you can see the profile here is the right size, but I've got three instead of two, so that's not going to work. The other one here, the reads are too fat for what I need. This set did come with a blank, so I'm going to have to make my own custom cutter head. I've got my new cutter in the beading tool here, so I'm ready to use it, but I'm also pretty excited because I created a second cutter head. There's a challenge that I've been trying to figure out in this curving, and that's how to cut these straight lines and curved lines here that seem to be square at the bottom. There just doesn't seem to be a way to curve that with a tool. And then I realized if I create a cutter head like this, I can use the beading tool to follow the profile here to get this curve and follow this line up here to get this straight line. So I'll give that a try after I try this new profile out. Now the back of my workbench has a backsplash and it comes in handy a number of different ways and this is one of them. So this is going to provide just a secure spot. I'm going to cut the profile here. I want a bit of a spacer. So this is just going to allow me to run the cutter across here, just progressively moving it and making sure the fence stays on the side of the piece. Just put that over the edge a little bit and walk through. And eventually I'll get the profile I need for this door. Now I'm going to profile that matches this one here. So I need to cut it down to size, fit it into here, and we're good to go. You can see here using the beading tool, I'm getting a much crisper line than what I was doing when I was curving. So this is definitely the solution I'm going to use to make these outlines. As I've been practicing carving, I've been struggling with this one part that's really deep. And I've been working with different chisels to try and figure it out. And then it came to me that likely there's just one chisel that the craftsman was using when they were carving this part. So I ended up sticking with one chisel and magically I'm getting the results I was looking for. The problem I was having is over here in this area where I'm carving out the leaf, but trying to clean out underneath. And you can see all that fuzziness in there. Definitely not a carved surface. Over here it was a little bit easier on the side grain, but on that end grain, it was really tough. So what I ended up doing was chopping out these surfaces here, and then I used this to scoop out the area into that cut. And that's giving me the look that I need to copy. I'm now comfortable enough that I can reproduce this carving. So I'm going to plane down this board, get it glued up with the other one, and then I can work on the final carving. Now when I'm learning a skill like this that's new to me, there are two things that I need. One is knowledge and the other is experience. I'm relying mostly on YouTube for knowledge, just like you, and then for experience you've seen me experiment on this board. This has been much more challenging than I anticipated, so I've got three different solutions here. I'm using carving chisels, I'm using a beading tool, and I'm using a carving knife. I never anticipated that. I thought, oh, just carving tools will do it. But you live and learn. I make sure I'm solving the right problem and that's what helps me get through a challenge like this. I'll move on to the planer. We'll get this glued up 
and let's get going on it. Now that I have a clean edge here, I can put my new block in. And then what I need to do is determine where this arch is going. So this distance here is a wider opening than this one. So if I take this distance, lock it in my calipers, this will tell me how wide this arch needs to be. So now I can draw the curve here. I'll cut this out before I glue it on. I fine tuned the profile here, so I've got a nice flush fit here and here. So I'm ready for the glue up. I put a clear report cover here so nothing's going to stick to this board and I've clamped this down because I want these surfaces the same height. So I'll clamp this here when I glue it, I'll clamp it end to end as well and then we'll set it aside to dry. I'm using a dark PVA glue here and this will give me a permanent bond and I like using dark glue because it's less likely to show the seam. I've got a fair bit of finishing work to do here so it's not that big of a concern on this particular piece. But it just makes things a lot easier if I don't have to contend with an issue later on. I've got a slight height difference in the wood here. So this will just get me to the right height. I can clamp this down and glue it. I've got some good squeeze out here so I know I fully loaded that joint and that's going to be a nice solid connection between these two pieces. I'm just cutting a small rabbit in the back here to allow the panels to sit behind this piece of trim. And then I can glue it into the repaired piece that broke off. Hold this up here and you can see what the profile looks like. Here you can see the rabbit there for the panel. And this one I need to make a little bit deeper. The last step I'm going through here is just taking off that last edge that's left over from when I was making this profile. I'll sand this and we'll be all ready to go. I've marked the center here so I can glue this piece in place and I fit it so I've got a good snug fit. And again, I'm using dark PVA for this for a permanent bond. So I'll just go through, apply the glue, making sure I don't get any on the panel because the panel needs to float. There's wood movement that happens across that wood panel, so I want to let it continue to expand and contract without any resistance because you've seen what happens when you don't let wood move. There we go. Let that dry, and then I can stain the parts. I've got a few more things to glue up here. One is the cabinet top. I've turned the cabinet upside down so the weight is on it and that allows me to put these glue blocks in. And the other is the corner bracket. After that, I need to let the glue dry. On the carving part, I need to make sure that that glue is full strength. And for that glue, it takes 24 hours. So I need to make sure that it's cured enough that I'm not gonna be damaging it as I work through it. So I'll work through a few more parts here. We'll work on a little bit of staining and then I can get to the carving. These were the original glue blocks and they allow for wood movement. This board is moving this way, this one's moving this way, so they're moving at the same rate. And when putting in glue blocks like this, you can't really clamp them. So what I do is use high glue because high glue 
allows you to do something called a rub joint. So here I've got some glue on a board. What I do is put it in here, put it in place, rub it back and forth, and the suction will keep it in place and pull it in. So we'll just do that with these other blocks here, and we'll be good to go. I have to glue in this bracket, and it's going on the top here, and look at the beautiful detail that's in this. That's a wonderful piece to top off this sheet music cabinet. Right here, there is a channel that the bracket goes in, so I need to clean up the glue here, and then I can put it back together again. Before I glue this up, I thought I'd show you the mahogany in this slot compared to the mahogany that I'm using. This is probably a different species. It's a little bit lighter, and mahogany does age, and as it ages, it gets more brown and less red. So I've got uh, quite a bit of tinting to do here to get this to look like this when it's finished. Now we need to find out what stain is going to work best to get this mahogany and this birch to look like this wood. Now I've got some mahogany pieces that I've made up from a previous project that helps me through this process. I haven't done that yet with birch. I should probably do that. But what I'll do is show you these various samples and I can tell which one immediately I need to use to match this project. These samples are like paint chips. So what I've done is taken raw wood and I've written the stain on the back. And you can see these are slightly different colors, but you can't just rely on the stain. You also need to put a finish on it. So I put garnet shellac on these ones and shellac is the finish I've got. So I need to take this wood and get it to look like this. So you can see this one here, for example, this is no shellac. This is one coat, two coats, three coats. So the garnet shellac can help deepen the color. So of all these, it looks like these are the two closest. This is the one I'm going to use. So this is espresso with garnet shellac. Getting this light colored birch to match the rest of the cabinet is going to be a challenge. So I've got some scraps. I'm going to do some experiments to make sure I can understand what finish I need to put on the carving once I've got it done. What I'm going to do is start with some water-based stains. And this one is a mahogany. I'll just let that sit there for a minute. And then this one is a rosewood. So i just clean off my brush here. What I want to do is really just set the undertone. And then what I'll do is uh, change the color as need be as I build up the color. So these are looking a little bit reddish, but that's not a bad thing because what I can do is darken it over top. So I've just put on the stain. I'm going to wipe it off now. To get an idea of what it looks like. Actually, this one's not looking too bad. So that rosewood, I think will be a good undertone to get it looking a little bit dark, but not dark enough yet for my final finish. While well, I had my stains out, I just put the sample board together. So these are the most common stains I typically use. That way I can put a coat of shellac on here when it dries and I can see what that's like. I'll likely put shellac on one side and maybe a different type of finish on the other. That just gives me an index to work with for future projects. I'm going to wrap up my workday here and in the morning when my mind is fresh, I'm going to tackle the carving. I don't want to be doing that at the end of the workday because I find I'm not as focused and I'm more apt to make mistakes. And if I make mistakes here, my beard's going to be getting longer. So I'll turn on the camera in the morning and we'll get to the carving. Before I start the carving, I want to sand it with 120 and then 220 to make sure I've got a nice smooth surface here. The first thing I need to do is put the layout on here to make sure I can get all the parts lined up the way they should be. This is proving really difficult to line up, so what I'm going to do is take a pair of scissors. I'm going to cut away most of what's here so I can line up the pattern. There, that makes it much easier. Now I can insert some tracing paper and trace up my part like I do when I practiced.
So I'm going to start the carving by working on the outline with the beading tool, and then what I'll do is work my way inside with the carving once I measure all the parts. This is a V-groove tool and it's used for outlining parts, but as I go through here I've just made a shallow line first and then what I'm doing is I'm rotating it because I need a straight line down at this edge at the front, but a gradual line at the back. So my second pass here is just defining that front edge there. Lighting is also important to be able to see what you're carving. So I've got a studio light pointed this way. So it's pretty extreme from what I normally film at, but it's really helping me understand what I've carved, what I haven't, and what the profile needs to look like. Now that I have the outline, what I want to do is figure out the detail here. So if I move this over, you can see there are a number of leaves here I need to lay out and I want to make sure that circles in the right spot. It just doesn't look right visually here. So what I'm going to do is use dividers to be able to mark out how far apart things are here. So for example, I'm going to go from the corner here, mark the center of that leaf. So if I Put this in the corner here. This mark will be the center of that leaf. This mark will be the center of that leaf. Now, I go from here and extend this to the circle here. Just make sure I've got it lined up right. Then I'll be able to double check this as well. Yeah, it's in the right spot. Okay, just didn't look right. 
So what I'm going to do now is draw out the parts and then I can start carving them. So I've now got this chisel here that will allow me to get these curves here and here and what I'll be doing is chopping straight down and then coming in and scooping it out. So on this inner part of the circle, chop straight down and then that outer line is really where I come in on the angle and scoop out the parts. So go through and cut these out. Next, I'm going to use the same chisel and then carve out the curve here, the curve here, and then work it in just on an angle here to clear that out and to clear this out. This is the area that I've had a real challenge with. I'll show you over here. It's a little bit hard to see in the light. Let me just change the lighting on the camera. So right in here, this area getting it cleaned out the right way. So that's what I'm aiming for. So you can see the shape starting to form here with the depth of that cut. I need to go twice as deep, so I need to do that again, and I'll work my way around to these other parts as well. The next part of the carving is the front edge here, and this is a straight line, but it gradually slopes right here. I'll show you on this part here. Let's change the lighting. So it's deep right here at the front edge, and then there's a gradual climb. So I'll just switch chisels here, and I'll clear that area out. Having sharp chisels is really important, but it's also important to cut with the grain. So the grain is this way. What I'm going to do is cut this way. If I were to cut this way, I would be breaking into the grain. So grain orientation is certainly a part of something you need to understand when you're curving. And having sharp tools is absolutely essential. I'll show you the strap later that I use to sharpen these. I goofed a little bit right here, and you can see this piece of wood is just starting to lift a little bit. So what I need to do is put some glue in there and glue it back down to preserve the carving. So what I'll do is just take a little bit of PVA glue on the end of a needle. I keep the sewing needle in my shop because it's pretty handy at times. So I'll just gently work it underneath that piece and hopefully not break it off.
and then get it back down again. Get out as much glue as I can so that I'm not contaminating the carving with glue. It's finicky work, but I really don't want to have a chip out here. Okay, so I think it's time for a break. I'll just put a little bit of weight on here and let that dry. The next part to carve is this part here, and this is the one where I need a carving knife to cut this. I'll show you what this looks like. So there just isn't a way I could figure out how to use a carving chisel to do this because it's an ellipse shape that goes deeper in the middle. The other one over here it's a little bit fatter, a little bit wider, so there's not a lot of consistency between these parts here and here. So I don't need to be really, really accurate, but enough to make it look like it's going to match. The lines I have here, I think, are too wide for what I need. This is called a chip carving technique, and all I need to do is drill a hole in the center to make it look like this one, and we're good to go. The next part of the design is to locate the holes. I'll show you what I mean. There are a number of little holes here, and once I've located those, then I can figure out where these little embellishments happen, and I can finish off the carving. So the hardest part of this carving is now done. I have to do the inside of this arch here, get it curved, and then we can test it in the cabinet. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm putting a bevel on this. There's a cove to it, meaning it's a slightly dished shape. In order to put a bevel on anything, you need reference lines. So I just use my hand here. This just comes from experience, holding your pencil against your finger. And that gives you a reference point to be able to go around the piece here and I'll do the same thing on the inside and then I'll have a line that I can work to to duplicate that cove.
chopping action I'm using here dulls my chisel pretty fast, so what I want to do is hone it, get it really sharp, and then I can just do a final cut by hand. I've got this chisel that I got from my grandfather, my opa. It's a Dutch chisel. Um, Nutgenhacht is the brand. Um, you can see here it says made in Holland. So I haven't been able to find any of these, but uh, I have heard from people in Holland that use these chisels. So I'm just honing it here on a leather strop that has honing compound on it. And what I do is roll this because of the curve as I'm honing it. And I'll do that 30 times and then I'll go on the letter side and do the same and you'll see how sharp this is. Phew, I got through it all. So we'll take a look at this when I get in the cabinet. Let me flip it over and I'll hold it up there and we'll see how it looks. Okay, so I'll put it in here. And then we've got some of these columns that go in. So you can see that the arches are formed well. I'm missing a column here, so I'm going to have to produce one. It's probably fairly straightforward work here compared to what I've been working on. And this is what I was producing. And this is what it looks like. Take a closer look. So I'm happy with how that turned out. Well, I'm going to take this one as a win. So how long did it take me to learn how to do this? Well, I've been growing my playoff beard here now for about two weeks. It's getting pretty long. And it's been about 30 hours of research and practice to go through and reverse engineer how to make this part. I'm long overdue for a shower and I'm going to trim this beard, get rid of this scruff, and then we'll come back and we'll start the staining process. Now for the finishing process, I've used garnet shellac and I've put them on my samples here so I can see what it looks like finished. And I've also taken a couple of carvings that I've done here and I put shellac on one side and not on the other. What can happen with the carving is because the, you're getting wood grain exposed, the carvings can look much darker when the stain hits it. So it'll be interesting to see how the stain reacts on both of these, and that'll help me determine what I need to do here. The other consideration is what stain to use on this. So this was my original selection. This is the rosewood. But you can see with the shellac on it, it's a little bit darker. And what I'm looking for here is really the background color, the lightest color possible so that I can augment it with darker colors. And I think that's really where this color is coming in here. This is called antique walnut. So I'm going to use the antique walnut on this. So let's put it on the carving sample and see what happens. So what I'm going to do is brush on the stain, make sure I get it in the crevices. And what I need to do is let it sit to let the stain soak in. I believe the technique I've learned about this is the shellac side, you're using oil-based stains. I'm using acrylic, and it's interesting because it looks like it's beating up here. So I'll set my timer for five minutes, and then come back and we'll take a look. While I wait, I'll tell you about the tools I've been using to be successful in this project. This is a carver's mallet. It's on a little bit of an angle, so that as you're working on the chisel, um, you really don't have to focus on where you're hammering because it's curved all the way around. So this is just a test piece that I put together with a scrap piece of wood. Um, it does feel a little too heavy for what I'm doing. I think the next one I make is going to be smaller. I turned this on the lathe using just a chunk of wood that I found in my neighborhood. Someone was throwing it out in the garbage. So I dried it for a few years, turned it on the lathe, and I tested out my new dust collection system, my invention called Clean Lathe. You can see more about that on my Clean Lathe YouTube channel. Now for chisels, what I did was I purchased a set of seven beginner chisels. So let me just take two chisels out here. So this was the beginner set here. Um, it's got a V chisel, and then these are a bunch of different curves, different sizes. I also bought a micro V groove chisel and a skew. Um, I didn't end up using the skew at all, 
but this one certainly helped me do the detailed work that I needed. Now it's important, as I mentioned before, that you've got sharp tools. So this is a strop that I bought. Um, it's got a number of different profiles on it for the inside of the chisels and on the outside rubbing it on here with compound. Uh, the compound is what acts as an abrasive. So this is what you use to keep your chisel sharp. So for every 30 minutes or so that you're carving, you need to make sure you strap them to keep them sharp. And then of course, the beading tool that I purchased, uh, this is a Veritas tool that is no longer being sold. So um, you can't really go and buy this particular one, but a beading tool can be a very versatile tool. I also used a carving knife. So this is one that um, can be put in your pocket. There's a longer blade here. And then the last one is my Opus chisel. Um, this one is a uh, number 10 and one that I've had for a long time and I've got it in my tool cabinet because it's got sentimental value. My sample is ready to check out now and what I'll do is go through the staining and finishing process. I'll put the door back on, get everything together and we'll take a look at the final project. So you can see the stains beating up a little bit on the shellac finish on the right hand side here. So let's rub it down and see what it looks like. So it did prevent the stain from penetrating a whole lot but let's compare it to the carving. So you can see how dark these are, and it's actually darker inside here. So it's not a bad thing that the stain is taking more inside there. This, I think, is too light for the background here. I think this is more appropriate.
I hope you enjoyed this challenging restoration project. And to reward you for staying around to the end of the video, I'm going to give you a sneak peek on an upcoming piece of work I've got. It's at a castle that was built in the 19th century, and there's a very specific piece of furniture that's important to the history of this building. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, click over here and click on the bell icon. That way you'll get notified every time we publish a video. I'll leave another video for you right here that I know you'll enjoy. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture.